Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. All right, so now we are going to transition into our next panel. Uh, we have our wonderful sponsor, George Donnelly, who is here to talk to us about Bitcoin Cash. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you? Oh, absolutely wonderful. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. So so cool that you're doing this you know we need more stuff like this more events like this yeah no we're happy to have you and we're happy that you could help us pull this off honestly we would not be able to pull it off with wonderful sponsors like you cool sorry like you like Furman supreme like green market agorist Sorry about that. Hit a button. No worries. But it is wonderful to have you. So I hear you're going to talk to us today about Bitcoin Cash. So I will let you take that away. Okay, great, great. So um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can uh, share a uh, Chrome tab here with uh, my presentation. So... <clears throat> Yes. You know, uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, these things are all pretty cool. Um, but, uh, you know, I think anybody who follows uh, this uh, this ecosystem knows that a lot of it just revolves around greed, really. Uh, there's so many scams here. So it's, it's not really my – I've never really cared about the, the money aspect until I got into uh, thinking about financial inclusion. And so I see Bitcoin Cash as a tool uh, for facilitating that, for helping uh, the world with that. <clears throat> so, you know, we think of uh, the global poor, 
uh, people in the developing world, uh, you know, as they're called, the global poor. But they're not really that poor. Uh, they're simply unable to leverage their assets for growth due to regulatory obstacles, corruption, and the creation of walled gardens for the elite in the developing world. This is kind of the big truth uh, that I want to get across here. Actually, uh, thanks in large part to the work of um, the economist Hernando de Soto, Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto, he came to the conclusion that the developing world actually has more assets than the developed world. It's just that they're fragmented and they're not available to uh, to really leverage uh, and produce capital against them. So, you know, the basic thing, and this is this is the really interesting part of a uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin Cash is it's just a ledger. You know, maybe some people aren't aware of how it work, how you know Bitcoin works, um, and basically it's just a ledger. It just says it's a it, there are a bunch of uh, key pairs, and you know cryptographic key pairs, which are just basically accounts in a sense. Um, and you know each one has a balance assigned to it, a number of uh, of coins. And um, so really, this ledger it just says you know it's just a continuation of ledgers of the past, which like property uh, registries asset registries and all they do is they say who is responsible for what who has what yeah and kind of the the magic property of doing that is that it enables the creation of capital because once you can take a uh, piece of land or 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 an apartment or a car and you can put it on a ledger then suddenly it's tradable uh, you can create derivatives out of it. You can uh, leverage it and and bar you can borrow against it, right? So really, at the end of the day, uh, you know what Bitcoin is is it's a big ledger. People make lots and lots of copies of it. And then if you want to make a change to the ledger, in other words, if you want to send a payment, then you have to pay uh, miners who play math games, really in order to get the right to process these transactions and thus earn a reward. And um, and then changes are made. And this happens every 10 minutes in Bitcoin Cash, essentially. So, uh, you know, a, a big element of this is the informal economy. Uh, and I know that my fellow agorists in uh, the audience are going to love this. 60% of working people globally are estimated to be in the informal economy. The informal economy, they're just people who basically, uh, you know, they had their businesses aren't registered. Uh, maybe, maybe they don't have bank accounts. Uh, you know, maybe they're not complying with all the rules and regulations, right? I mean, these are basically ag agorists. You know, they don't, they probably haven't heard of agorism, but basically they're, they're practicing agorists. <laughs> and they're two billion working people worldwide who are in the informal economy. And if you go to places like, uh, for example, where I am in Colombia, um, <clears throat> more than 60% of jobs are in the informal economy. In some places in uh, South Asia and Africa, the percentage is even higher. And so what, what this actually creates is a situation of financial exclusion because, because these people have not entered the formal economy, which is essentially a, a white market, really, that has been gamed for the benefit of elites. Yeah. For example, here in Colombia, uh, I would say probably at least 80% of the population uh, is pretty much in poverty. Uh, 20% is doing okay. And then there's a very small group of people, you know, X number of families, I don't know, maybe 100 families, it's hard to know really for sure, who control these vast corporate conglomerates, conglomerates that, that produce beer, produce food, produce juice, uh, you know, own TV and radio stations, and their children are senators and presidents. And so, um, you know, they 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 create these situ these these walled gardens with uh, each one with its own currency and its own central bank, um, 
and people get locked out. You know, for example, to get a bank account here in Colombia, not that I'm a fan of banks, but you actually have to have a letter from an, saying that you have a job, <laughs> like a like a formal job, you know, with a company that's duly registered and everything. Otherwise, you can't get a bank account. Forget it. Um, and so this, you know, even though I'm not a fan of banks, like having a bank account can enable people to to set up like a, a financial reputation, to be eligible for loans, to uh, you know establish a, an, an income history. <clears throat> but these people, they do the informal economy. They do business mostly in cash, and um, they're locked out of all that. And that's actually most people in the world. Um, so th this is this is an opportunity, really. So and and in the developing world, ledgers are fragmented and broken. For example, um, to register a property in the Philippines can take many many weeks. Uh, to when Hernando de Soto visited Cairo, Egypt, he discovered that many buildings, um, the owner. You know, when he wanted to know who the owner was, like he, the process for vouching for who the owner was, was by visiting the neighbors. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, so-and-so owns that. That's his. But, you know, if he visited the central uh, property registry of the city of Cairo, that that would not agree with, you know, who's living in the house and who the neighbors say own the house. And, of course, the... um the prototypical example here is a farmer, say in Peru, he has possession of his land, right? It's his land. He bought it. He gave somebody cash for it, presumably the previous owner, but he doesn't have, um, he doesn't have a legal title to the land because it's too expensive and it would take weeks of full-time work to go and get that title, right? And he, I mean, he lives in a, in a, in a, in a rural area. He doesn't live in a city or town where he can really access this. And so he has his land. It's nice land, but he can't borrow against it. He can't go to a bank and get a loan so that he can buy seeds to plant the land. This is the kind of, this the situation that happens over and over again, you know, uh, in the United States, Europe, you know, you, you, you would never dream of uh, take you know taking paying for a property <clears throat> until you did a title search, right? And until you know, and you once the title was in your name, you know you paid. And then once you had that title, you can do things you know like uh, mortgages and lines of credit and all this stuff, so that you can have your lunch and eat it too. Essentially, right? You can have your house and you can also spend the money. Uh, that you used to pay for the house at the same time. And of course, in the United States, that's taken uh, a little bit to, to an extreme, uh, maybe not even a little bit. Um, it's abused quite a bit. But the basic idea of being able to borrow against an asset is economically useful um, and not necessarily always abusive. And so we have all these people who own property in the developing world. They have all these assets, but they can't leverage them. So they are highly limited in their economic growth. For example, there is a uh, charity here in Colombia called Sujo, I believe. And basically what they do is one by one, they help people, uh, you know, they help cover the costs and the paperwork and all that of people getting actual legal title to their properties. You know, and that's nice. That's real nice. But uh, that's a Band-Aid on a broken system. You know, that, that's not really a, a, a solution that can help billion, the billions of people who are in this situation. So Bitcoin Cash. <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin Cash is a. Um, uh, is a cryptocurrency. It's about a top 10 cryptocurrency. Uh, basically, Bitcoin Cash is the original uh, version of Bitcoin. But uh, there is uh, there was for several years a, uh, a wide-ranging debate about scaling Bitcoin, about enabling there to be more and more transactions all the time on Bitcoin. Now, it's, for some 
people that that's probably hard to really understand because of course you build a really cool system like Bitcoin and you want everybody to be able to use it. Right. Um, but unfortunately uh, what seems to have happened is that the people, uh, some people were given uh, control of the Bitcoin core uh, software and they kicked out, you know, the, the guy that uh, Satoshi uh, handed the kind of the keys to the kingdom to. And uh, they went out and they formed a corporation and they took venture capital. And all of a sudden they didn't want Bitcoin cash to grow, uh, sorry, Bitcoin to grow. And they wanted uh, transactions to happen off the chain, which is less secure. And so, um, you know, after a lot of drama in 2017, uh, Roger Veer and, and, you know, many developers and whatnot, uh, started uh building uh forking supporting um bitcoin cash and bitcoin cash today can process um <clears throat> probably about 30 to 32 times as many transactions as uh bitcoin core uh and the fees you know you can send a transaction and it costs about uh, a fifth or a tenth of a penny uh in us dollars and so um Whereas currently, uh, to send a payment on Bitcoin Core, um, it can take a very long time uh, for the payment to go through. Bitcoin Cash, it's instant. And the fees, the average fees are right now are around $15 per transaction. So, you know, let's say you get tipped or paid uh, $20 in Bitcoin Core and uh, you want to do something with it. Well, you only have $5 left. <laughs> because the transaction fee is $15. And so Bitcoin Core has turned into a system for the rich, right? The, you know, us regular people and are not welcome and you can completely forget about the so-called global poor. Uh, they're not welcome. They're literally not welcome uh, in Bitcoin Core. And so Bitcoin Cash uh, has um, the, uh, is completely ready uh to onboard these people and in fact i've been working for the last three years uh in the developing world and have onboarded thousands of people uh to crypto as well as merchants um so you know so what's the solution uh to this situation uh of the you know the the people in the developing world the informal economy uh, people who who are operate completely informally they can't really register co uh, corporations um, they deal completely in cash. They can't get bank accounts. They, they buy a house, but they don't own the title to it. Well, you know, some people say, well, governments have to do more, uh, to, uh, get, uh, these people into the uh, formal economy. But, uh, I tell you, Hernando de Soto, who is really a hero, I think he has spent decades, he even has run for president. He might be running for president again now in Peru, but he even ran for president of Peru. I mean, he literally toured that country up and down and told everybody all about his research, certainly way better than, you know, the, the meager synopsis that I've provided uh, this evening. And, and still, he didn't win the presidency and he didn't substantially change things because the bottom line is that in these countries like Colombia, Venezuela, Nigeria, you know, Thailand, there is there's an elite and they have captured the nation state and the corporate sector, uh, you know, there is, there's a, 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 a incestuous relationship there and they conspire to keep everybody else out. Uh, they conspire to keep everybody else scraping and clawing in order to survive. And that's why we have extreme poverty that's why we have, uh, you know, that's why you, it certainly hel it doesn't help human trafficking. That's why we we have problems like not clean uh, water, uh, malnutrition. Um, and so really, you know, if you think about it, like governments are not going to solve this, right? It, like we could spend another hundred years begging them to do the right thing and they're still not going to do it because their own uh, assets uh, in their own position of power would be threatened by that, right? Um, and likewise, whereas there, there are many NGOs uh, who are very um, well-intentioned, 
Um, but they're not they're not attacking the root of the problem. They're just fixing things around the edges. So really, the solution, I think, is a property and asset ledger on uh, the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So, I mean, blockchains are essentially immutable. You can't, once you put things on there, you can't change it. And Bitcoin Cash in particular, not all cryptos, but Bitcoin Cash is extremely decentralized with uh, miners securing the chain all over the world, multiple dev teams. And so, uh, you know, I think that we need to launch a, a property ledger and market it and essentially compete with all of these, uh, you know, property registries and asset ledgers across the globe and get people to register, uh, you know, instead of having to, to pay, you know, spend days or weeks to get your property registered and pay th maybe thousands of dollars. Instead of having to rely on the charity of, an, of a very nice NGO like Sujo, you just go and you go to a form and you register it uh, on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain for, for less than a penny. Um, and of course, there can be witness procedures and, you know, different uh, ways to verify, you know, to work against any kind of fraud. Um, but it's absolutely doable. And, um, you know, really interesting thing that happened uh, this week is that uh, the Nigerian uh, central bank said, hey, cryptos are completely banned, you know, and we don't want any more cryptos here because and a Nigerian center said because it's just making our currency completely valueless and useless. And that's the value, you know, even though Bitcoin BTC has been corrupted, captured uh, and is is currently being rendered, uh, you know, just a toy for the Wall Street elite, uh, you know, a, a, the true Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin Cash, can still be that sound money that is not manipulable. You know that you know when there's a political crisis, you you know some uh, you know Latin American uh, dictator can't just come in and issue a thousand new uh, Bitcoin uh, cash to himself in order to you know s distribute food to the poor or something to keep them happy. Um, you know, a sound currency uh, creates a situation of accountability because the, the ability to manipulate the money supply enables people to, um, you know, you can render whole swaths of the economy um, destitute. Uh, you know, you can, you can direct new money to, you know, as we're seeing in the stock market, for example, now. Uh, you can direct new money to to the stock market, you know, by hook or by crook. And so some people, uh, some people, their relative share of the wealth accelerates, accelerates greatly, while the rest of us stand still or fall backwards. Uh, and so uh, using a currency, a sound currency with a limited supply, uh, like that can't be manipulated like Bitcoin Cash, gets around that. Uh, basically, it just it puts the lie right because. You know, if you look at the modern monetary th uh, theory uh, theorists and whatnot, um, they believe they can they can print as long as they want. They can print new money as long as they want because, well, in the United States, the U.S. dollar is the biggest fraud, right? Every all the other little frauds, the Nigerian uh, naira and the uh, you know the Venezuelan bolivar and the uh, Argentinian peso, like all all of these use the US dollar as the as a reserve. You know, that that's hard money for them. That's how that's what they fall back to. Uh you look at a place like Venezuela where of course there's been hyperinflation for years. It's it's a disaster. And uh the economy is fully dollarized. That's what they fall back to. So the U they can the US Federal Reserve can keep printing because it's the biggest fraud. But what's gonna happen when there is something for people to fall back to? Their little game is going to uh, going to fall apart pretty pretty rapidly. So you know, uh, a property register, uh, an immutable, unmanipulable one that people can access extremely easily, a sound currency, um, and a we need a global marketplace or network of marketplaces that breaks people out of the. Um, not wallet, but walled, uh, these walled oligarchic gardens uh, in the developing world. So people can trade across borders, right? Because that, that, that enables economic gains as well. 
So, uh, you know, I think that uh, using Bitcoin Cash and using the principles of, uh, you know, agorism, uh, left libertarianism, market anarchism, et cetera, you know, we can outcompete the current financial system uh, in the developing world and essentially render it obsolete. You know, I think that the Nigerian uh, Senate is, you know, seeing the writing on the wall there. It may be closer than we think. We could spark an economic growth miracle, not unlike uh, the Asian tigers of the 20th century, which really could materially resolve poverty, malnutrition, human trafficking, and other intractable ills. You know, one way that people get trafficked because is because there's there's not there are insufficient uh, work uh, opportunities in where they are, right in their home country. And so they become vulnerable uh, to people who say, yeah, I'll give you a job in this other country. And then they transport them across national lines and they take their passport and, you know, and then the shame kicks in. And then, um, you know, they really have their hooks on these people and it's hard uh, to get out of it. And in fact, sometimes these people will get out of it and then we'll go back again because they literally have no other opportunities. Uh, that they consider uh, sufficient to develop their lives. And that's all because of these walled gardens that exist, uh, you know, across the developing world. So really, I think that is uh, the strategy for, uh, in a nutshell, <clears throat> for how to spark uh, a financial inclusion evolution across the developing world using Bitcoin Cash. Um, so, you know, we're working, I've been working, researching on this, uh, doing field work, uh, in the developing world, particularly Latin America for about three years. Um, currently I'm doing a lot of work in the Bitcoin cash ecosystem. Uh, we're running a bunch of different promotions. We're doing a lot of, uh, education. Um, and so you can find out more about us at uh, bitcoincash.site. That's actually a URL. Um, and, um, yeah, that's, that's about, uh, the extent of, uh, of my, uh, presentation. We actually had a, a D live question. Awesome. That, yeah, we were, sorry, I'm getting situated. I just started eating. Um, looks like folks were curious how Bitcoin Cash looks to solve some of the environmental problems that we have seen surrounding the use of cryptocurrency and the infrastructure needed in order to utilize it. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, this probably revolves around uh, electricity usage um, for uh, um, for quite some time now, um, a lot of the mining has taken place in China. And so actually a lot of it has come from, uh, hydropower, um, you know, Chinese dams and whatnot. There are also, uh, quite a, there's a growing movement to use, to have solar powered mini, uh, mining farms. Uh, there's also some places where they're doing uh, geo geothermal. And there is a new trend. Actually, I did an interview uh, recently with Jonathan Tumim, who is a uh, miner and uh, developer, a long time in the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin space, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And um, the new trend is actually moving out, it seems, of uh, China and into Central Asia where... Um, so that, you know, when, when they find uh, oil and they're going to pull it out of the ground, uh, it often comes with uh, large amounts of natural gas. And so currently uh, what happens in, in many places, um, you know, if we're lucky, is that that natural gas gets flared. So basically what happens is they, they light it on fire as it comes out of a, a pipe uh, out of the ground. And so those those things will flare twenty four seven for years, um, and you know with a basic flaring uh, operation, the 
uh, the burning is not that efficient. It's still, you know, it's better than just get, you know, letting that stuff exit into the atmosphere. But um, it's still, you know, not really a hundred percent efficient, n anywhere near it. Um, for example, uh, in Venezuela, where the the oil industry, you know, Venezuela a huge, has huge uh, oil and gas uh, reserves, but the industry is in complete uh, disarray. There, in some places, they're not even flaring the gas. And so uh, there are parts of the country, I believe around uh, Maracaibo particularly, where you can't get anywhere near it because literally the, the air is just so full of, uh, of natural gas. And so what this new trend is, is that, um, and of course, you know, just flaring off the gas or letting it go into the atmosphere, it represents a cost uh, for uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the owners of the fields, as well as a lost opportunity. And so what they're doing is they're capturing uh, that uh, natural gas. They are burning it more cleanly and uh, converting it into electricity uh, for uh, crypto mining. And this, this also has uh, the benefit, you know, in, in uh, areas that are fairly politically stable, you know, if you compare those to, for, for example, Iraq, in Iraq, uh, you know, due to the instability, this is not really feasible. And there, uh, there are some villages where um, it, there are just flares running all the time near the village, near where people live. And people are developing uh, different sicknesses, like they're literally sunburned all the time uh, from uh, the heat and the fire of these flares. And so in this sense, the industry, I think, in, you know, with this is moving uh, towards actually, um, you know, not just not just, um, you know, different sources of power, but also solving environmental issues, you know. And so uh, I think this is uh, the free market, you know, at work, you know, people looking for uh, opportunities that were, were being lost uh, in the past and today are actually producing a win all around, you know, both for, both for the, the field owner, uh, for the miner and uh, for the rest of us, you know, via the, the environment. So, um, so I think that that's pretty interesting on that front. We have another question. We have another question from D Live. Um, they were curious about the privacy aspects of Bitcoin Cash, and I know myself just hearing the kind of overblown claims of the nature of privacy of Bitcoin early on, and seeing you know how people got confused over that so i'm curious how you would know what is the privacy of bitcoin cash mm -hmm. so um you know the basic ledger uh is uh essentially transparent um you know everybody can see uh which addresses which public keys have uh which balances uh, and in this sense, this is helpful to ensure that, for example, there are no inflation bugs uh, in the system, you know, to ensure that uh, the supply that is that there's expected to be, uh, you know, is really what it is, uh, you know, so that you can, you know, everybody can ensure that there really are a limited number of uh, coins in the system. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash basically are not anonymous at all, but they are pseudonymous, right? So for example, if, uh, you know, I have my Bitcoin Cash wallet, inside a wallet, I could have hundreds of addresses. And a Bitcoin Cash address is kind of like a um, like an email address, right? It has the public part, which is your email address, you know, me at whatever. And um, it has the private part, which is your password to access your email. So in Bitcoin Cash, uh, the public part is your your address, your public address, which is basically a long alphanumeric string of letters and numbers. And the private part is your private key, which uh, in many wallets today takes the form of a 12 or 24 word 
uh, recovery phrase, which is super, super important that you store that securely uh, because if something happens to your computer or your phone or wherever you you act, you view your, your coins and, and use them, then you're going to need that recovery phrase to get them back. Um, so, you know, let's say I pull one direction, uh, one, ad, sorry, one address out of my wallet, or maybe I even make a new wallet and I pull an address out there. Um, if I publish that online and say, Hey, you know, I'm George and this is my address. And, um, and you know, you can send me a tip here or whatever, or you can pay, you know, your, your bill here. Uh, well, that's going to be pretty easy for big companies like chain out chain analysis or chain analysis, uh, to, you know, say, aha, that address belongs to this name. Right. Um, and of course they package up that information and sell that, uh, <laughs> to all the governments, <laughs> you know, chain analysis is not, is not one of my favorite, uh, companies. Um, although they do release some interesting information. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Of course, if you never associate that address with your name, then you're going to have a higher level of security. But let's say that you have uh, some Bitcoin cash, you got a bunch of payments, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you want, um, you like, you want, you just kind of want that money to, to not be associated with, with those public addresses anymore. You want a higher level of privacy. So what you can do is you can go to electroncash.org, uh, download the Electron Cash website, sorry, uh, wallet. Uh, it's available uh, for you know all the uh, desktop uh, systems as well as iOS and Android. And uh, but I think to access the privacy features, it might only be on desktop at the time. And so you enable cash fusion in there. And this is a new privacy technology uh, that um, has been active on Bitcoin Cash for about a, uh, about a year. And basically what you do is you take your balances, you know, your your Bitcoin Cash, your coins, and you, you know, you say that you want to mix them. And so you mix them trustlessly. Uh, with other people around the world and basically it mixes them up in a bunch of different uh, small denominations, sends them out, it brings them back. And then um, the number of potential combinations is, is so large that it is effectively impossible to determine, um, you know, who, what happened really, who, who, who had so many coins and sent so many coins, it's really uh, essentially impossible uh, to determine it th at that point. So ca uh, via Cash Fusion, um, you, Bitcoin Cash has excellent, excellent privacy. It's just optional privacy. We had another, we had another viewer question. Uh, folks were curious what you thought about the recent uh, Reddit buyout of GameStop stocks and similar stocks. Yeah, I think uh, it was really <clears throat> great uh, that you know the Wall Street Bets uh, subreddit um, basically caused all these uh, large hedge funds to uh, to kind of go broke. Because basically what, what these, these hedge funds do is when they don't uh, like uh, a stock for whatever reason, and uh, Patrick Byrne, uh, former CEO of Overstock, uh, has done a lot of investigation into this, uh, some really interesting stuff. You can Google uh, like Patrick Byrne, uh, B-Y-R-N-E, and uh, naked short selling and, and come up with some really uh, interesting um, information there. Uh, but basically what they do is that they will, so there's this concept of short selling and basically, you know, most people think, you know, you buy a stock and you buy it because you hope that the price goes up, right? Like maybe you buy a share of Apple at $100 and you're like, yeah, let's hope it goes to $500, right? Um, but so short selling is the opposite of that. You buy a share, uh, actually you borrow a share, um, and then you sell it and you hope that the price will go down so that when you have to pay back the share, you can buy it more cheaply. 
But what a lot of these hedge funds are accused of doing is something called naked short selling, which means that they don't borrow a share in the first place in order to sell it. They simply sell a share in this company that they don't like uh, without ever possessing it in the first place, which is kind of hard to wrap the, the the head around, you know. Um, and so what the, they'll what they'll do is they'll artificially drive down uh, the price of uh, of stocks and of, of companies that they uh, that they don't like. And this is a tactic I think that the Wall Street elite, you know, connected people, people who are connected to, you know, the largest banks, largest financial institutions, maybe even the central bank, uh, that they use to rig the game in their favor. And so, um, you know, the only way to to really call their bluff is to um, to cause the price, you know, so they, they, they bet against GameStop, right? So maybe they bought, maybe they uh, sold uh, shares of uh, GameStop at like uh, $4 and because they expected it to go down to 50 cents. Well, then once GameStop goes to $10, $20, $50, $100, $100, then the people who are on the other side of that, that sale, uh, they want, you know, they want to get, they, 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 they like, they're not happy and they're like, hey, give us the money, you know. Uh, to the hedge funds and then the hedge funds really have to pony up and now it costs they thought they were going to profit off of these deals and now there it's actually costing them tens or maybe hundreds of times more uh than um like their downside just is, accelerates and so um basically what they did by driving up the prices essentially bankrupt all these hedge funds and punished them quite severely uh, for uh, this naked short selling or short selling uh, that they were doing. They had, you know, they ran out of money, they satisfied obligations, and they had to get additional money from other people, which implies that whoever was uh, holding, you know, shares of, uh, of the uh, hedge fund probably had to sell a lot of those shares and reduce their, their participation uh, in that hedge fund. So it represented financial losses for the elite. So, you know, it's kind of a, a rebellion of sorts, but it's also, it's kind of like a rebellion in a teacup because since it's a rigged game, uh, these hedge funds can always get more funds, you know, they, they can always get bailed out. Um, and that, so that's really why, you know, I think it's so important, uh, to kind of opt out of that system and, um, you know, look into uh, cryptocurrencies, you know, definitely cryptocurrencies in the top 20 or 30. I wouldn't get too mixed up in the really small ones because uh, there's there's a lot of shady stuff there. One of our other viewers was curious what you think of the corporatization of cryptocurrency. Um, not only in the creation of like corporate coins, uh, but also in big companies who, you know, very much fall into the corporate capitalist spectrum of just not companies we should trust starting to accept cryptocurrency. And w such as AT and T or others, and whether we should trust that or not. Yeah, that's an interesting development. You know, if you look at, uh, for example, PayPal recently announced that they were going to enable uh, PayPal customers to uh, buy and sell. Excuse me, uh, cryptos, among them Bitcoin Cash. Um, but here's the thing. You go into PayPal and you buy uh, some Bitcoin cash, but you can't withdraw uh, that Bitcoin cash uh, from uh, PayPal. You can only uh, sell it again back for fiat. And so really, it's, it's a toy. It's not real. They can. It's just like Robinhood, the Robinhood app. They can manipulate it uh, to suit their needs. You know, it's kind of like like the the silver and gold market. For years, people have uh, you know said 
that um, a lot of people are selling paper uh, gold, you know, which is essentially they sell gold that they don't have kind of like what these um, uh, what these hedge funds uh, were doing uh, with um, with these stocks. And so, you know, it enables um, it enables them really to play games. You know, it's, it's like the same game that the banks play um, where, you know, they they may have a million dollars in actual deposits. But, you know, due to the, the, the banking laws, they can loan out up to nine times that much. And so it became becomes a game of musical chairs. You know, and we saw this, for example, in a, it's not so much like this anymore. Um, but, um, for example, the movie It's a Wonderful Life, where, um, you know, there was a run on the bank. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they, they only, the bank only had two, two, dollar, two one dollar bills left over. Um, you know, and so you wonder, you know, if behind the scenes, what is the accountability that keeps PayPal from, uh, say selling more, pay, more Bitcoin cash than it actually has on hand, you know? And so let's say that it actually sells 10 times as much Bitcoin cash than it, than it has on hand. And you think you have 10 Bitcoin cash in PayPal, but then, you know, something happens, you know, and PayPal goes goes bankrupt. And then in the bankruptcy proceedings, they only offer you to get one of your Bitcoin cash. Right. And meanwhile, the price of Bitcoin cash has gone up because, you know, uh, it's a scarce asset. And so you really would have gotten screwed over by that. Right. Because you you thought you had 10, but they tricked you. Right. And that's why it's so important and so powerful uh, with Bitcoin Cash in the crypto space is to control your own private keys, right? So that we have a saying, not your keys, not your coins, right? So if you go to an exchange like uh, Kraken or Binance, uh, a crypto exchange, and you, you know, let's say you put some fiat in there and let's say you buy uh, 10 Bitcoin Cash. Well, it's kind of the same thing because you don't really know if they have those those 10 Bitcoin Cash. Uh, maybe they're operating the same way that I, that I postulated that PayPal might might operate, and so, you know, and so when at an exchange, it's it's an account with a private business, like you don't you're not really you don't really have those those cryptos, but if you withdraw the cryptos from there into your wallet where you have already securely stored your private key, then you are self custodying custodying those funds. And, um, you know, you know, you have them because you have cryptographic proof, like you have the private keys to the coins that are on the blockchain. Uh, there's nobody between you and your money. Um, and th this is this is a powerful thing about uh, Bitcoin Cash and cryptocurrency. Um, it's also a tricky thing because if you don't if you're not careful about custodying your own money, uh, you know, you could lose access and then you've also lost your funds. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the whole corporate coin, uh, thing. Yeah. Understandable. I mean, and I doubt few people who are at any length aware of the original Bitcoin white paper and a lot of the goals of cryptocurrency if they read the crypto anarchist manifesto by timothy may which kind of you know really championed that idea long before it became a reality this was always a movement to try and take power away from wall street and the government and to see one of the things that i remember was seeing cryptocurrency pop up in the public eye around the same time as the Occupy Wall Street movement, where many people were very much coming out against corporate bailouts, against the banks, mm. and just generally critiquing our economic system and the power that corporations and Wall Street had to manipulate our economic systems. And whether... I think whether you agree 
whether your end goal includes money or not, and I know a number of libertarians who very much agree with, you know, gift economies or the moneyless manifesto or things like that, I think that cryptocurrency is so important. Hmm. We see how it's helped projects like, you know, Rojava be able to get around economic sanctions. We've seen how you know, various different groups have been able to use it to get around censorship, everything from WikiLeaks to various anti-fascist groups to various, you know, conservative groups, just all across the political spectrum be able to get around censorship. And it is very interesting that you still see a segment of anarchists who are completely ignoring cryptocurrency over economic disagreements at times without realizing how it still gets them closer to their goal. Mm. And, you know, I really, I mean, the way it's helped sex workers, the way it's helped, you know, make... Uh, purchasing drugs safer. I mean, you know, sure, like, we don't want it just associated with crime. Whatever the hell, pe the, however the hell the state likes to define it. Mm. But it's still, the point is that it makes things safer. So, you know, I really, really appreciate you coming and teaching my people about this type of thing. Um, how can people get set up so that way they can, you know, get their own cryptocurrency and get started? So I would say uh, really easy, uh, wallet.bitcoin.com or um, Edge Wallet, uh, which I think is at edge.app. Uh, those are two uh, very nice uh, cryptocurrency uh, wallets that you can get started with on mobile or on a desktop, electroncash.org. And then um, let's say, you know, if you're not ready to really buy, uh, what you can do is you can go to noise.cash, and that's a an experimental uh, Bitcoin Cash uh, social network. And, um, you know, you can publish content and you can get tipped there. Uh, read.cash is, uh, so noise.cash is Twitter-like and read.cash is basically the same thing, but it's more uh, like medium. Uh, there's also memo.cash, which is a more primitive kind of social network, but it runs directly on uh, the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So in all of those places, um, you can pick up some tips, you know, and, um, you know, start developing a little bit of a, a Bitcoin cash balance so you can start to feel comfortable, you know, sending and, and receiving it. And then if you would like to pick up some, uh, local.bitcoin.com is what's called a peer to peer exchange. Um, so, uh, it's not centralized like Binance or Kraken, you know, there's, there's like, there's no house behind it that, that manages all the trades. Uh, basically you go there and you can put, you can create an offer or you can find an offer and you can negotiate directly with individuals, uh, you know, individuals, uh, buyers and sellers, you know, people just like you and I, uh, or small businesses. And, uh, you know, if you can find an offer that you, you can like, you can buy. Um, and then there's, it's also a, a small business opportunity because, you can create buy and sell offers on the site uh, that are basically permanent. You know, they're they're enduring, and you can say, "Well, I'm I'll always buy Bitcoin Cash at uh, you know five percent under market, and I'll always sell it for five percent over market." And that way, you can be uh, assured uh, that you're you can make a profit at least in Bitcoin Cash terms uh, off of every uh, transaction. Uh, all the while, hope uh, helping to build. A decentralized marketplace, a decentralized ecosystem of small buyers and sellers uh, who, you know, provide liquidity, uh, you know, so that, you know, when, um, you know, when somebody needs to, to get Bitcoin cash, well, you know, there are lots of offers there. And when they need to, to get some fiat, well, they have lots of offers there. And that's 
that's how we get around, you know, some of these big corporate exchanges, which, you know, I have, I have friends at these places. I, I think these places provide enormous value, but I also think the days of the centralized uh, cryptocurrency exchanges are really numbered. Um, and the future is absolutely peer to peer, peer to peer exchanges like local.bitcoin.com. And so that represents, you know, an, uh, not just an opportunity for uh, people to easily and uh, fairly anonymously get into uh, crypto, but also a business opportunity. That is wonderful. Um, you know, we definitely encourage people to get involved in the crypto community to do it as anonymously as they see fit for their needs. And honestly, as anonymously as possible, regardless of your needs, because that means that it makes it that much harder for the NSA and other government agencies to track what you are doing, whether you're doing anything wrong or not, because honestly, they shouldn't have that power. Yeah, so definitely absolutely. get involved in that community. You know, go grab yourself some cryptocurrency. You know, you have recommended some wonderful exchanges. There are also some wonderful opportunities in our vendor section on coudegras.wtf. Um, you know, as far as signing up for things like Coinbase, do not keep your money there, though. Hmm. Um, you know, if if you want to link up, grab your bank account and and grab some money or uh, grab some crypto off of there. Take it off there, put it on something like Trezor or hard, you know, or cold storage wallet, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, we have wonderful opportunities. Go get Brave Browser. It's a privacy focused mm. browser and, you know, also uh, gives you cryptocurrency for watching very specific ads that they cater. Um, there's a link in our merch store or in our vendor section as well. Go check that out. Get involved. I mean, everyone that I, I, there are so many wonderful projects from antiwar.com to it's going down that are operating on these types of currencies. It really takes the power away from Wall Street. Mm. Where can people find you online? Where can people locate you and get involved with the projects that you are promoting? So uh, bitcoincash.site, uh, there's lots of information there. Um, also Bitcoin Cash site on Twitter and most other social media uh, on YouTube as well. Forum.bitcoincash.site is um, a, a growing community around uh bitcoin cash adoption and education uh particularly for the developing world but of course everyone uh is welcome this is a, a global evolution uh i am on uh twitter uh at george donnelly uh d-o-n-n-e-l-l-y i'm on you know a bunch of different facebook uh you know all this social media stuff floate.app uh mastodon uh george um yeah and so, and I welcome, you know, also on Telegram, you know, I welcome anybody and everybody to reach out, you know, if you uh, have any questions, if you need any uh, advice, if you're looking for something, um, yeah, just reach out and I'll, I'll be happy to help you anytime. And uh, you, were, you were mentioning a few different uh, interesting uh, projects in the blockchain space. Another one is uh, Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com which is basically a YouTube uh, successor project um, that is, you know, it's it's not perfect yet, but it's it's got a thriving community. And uh, last year, I you know, I had uh, three of my channels taken down over false copyright claims. Uh, I've got only gotten one of them back so far. And so, you know, uh, video communication is so powerful and projects like Odyssey, uh, are a great successor uh, to YouTube. So, and you can you can make you know they pay uh, credits for uh, doing different things on that platform. So that that's another interesting project in this space.
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We are going to start shifting to our next panel. All right. So, yeah. Excellent. Is there any last things you wanted to say to our audience, or was that? No, great work. It? Great work. Coup de gras. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. And, you know, best wishes with the rest of the event. Awesome. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you. we will see you tomorrow as well for a screening of what was the name of the documentary again? Uh, the Road to Mass Adoption. Awesome. Bitcoin Cash, The Road to Mass Adoption. And that will happen at 10 a.m. tomorrow, looking at the schedule. So please join us for that. We will have a small Q&A afterwards. The event will be streaming on the same channels it is now. Our The Coup de Gras Facebook, DLive, and the um, Green Market Agorist. Uh, D Live and the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party Facebook page. Yeah, so and possibly more. Check out on the Coup de Gras website, Coup de Gras.wtf, for the full schedule and links to everything. And join us tomorrow. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You have a thank wonderful. You. You too.